All right. I will. Um, your time is valuable. So I will go ahead and jump in. Um, I believe, Amara, correct me if I'm wrong, that recording goes out to everybody, the ones that are here live and the ones that aren't or come late. That's correct. And so that'll go to everybody after the call as well. Um, there's a whole bunch of slides here. And so we'll the first part of the webinar, we're going to talk about rescheduling. The last part of the webinar, we're going to talk about the Dope CFO program and everything in it and the pricing and the discounts and all that stuff. Um, I try to um, get out, try to do this in an hour because I know your time is valuable, but we'll see. I try to go pretty quick. Um, so let's look at, at 2024. We're going to look at the markets, rescheduling issues, how it'll affect the industry. And then, like I said, everything at the end. So I've been um, doing this. Not, I see some people I recognize um, teaching for about seven, almost eight years now. I lead the AICPA Cannabis Committee and their their annual cannabis conference, which will be this year in Denver. Um, I write for Journal of Accountancy, Accounting Today, lots of major media, um, accounting societies. I speak at cannabis events and not just me, my team, Ray, who's on this call too, and um, Christy and, and many others in our program. So as a matter of fact, we encourage you to speak if you join the program as well. There's just many, many, many events all over the U.S., digital, just like this one, and in real world as well. Um, so I will just jump in to the the slide. So I, I always show this one because I think it's this is the one that answers so many questions. Well, like, oh, I'm going to be embarrassed if I serve this, or I'm going to go to jail, or this, that, or the other. It's never going to be legal. And I just like, look at this slide. Seven out of 10 Americans, it's actually more. It's closer to eight now out of 10 Americans. And this is even in illegal states like Texas is a great example. Eight out of 10 Texans want access to legal medical cannabis. And there's a few um, politicians holding them back, but that, that won't last. Um, when we have this many people believe in something in America, and, and we all know this, our country is more divided than it's ever been. Um, things still can get through Congress and new laws, even with a 52% majority. But when we get to 70, 80% majority on a topic is extremely rare, first of all. And secondly, that means it's going to happen. That's why we've seen 47 states at this point um, legalize in some form. And 24 states, we're basically halfway there, are fully legal, meaning basically like alcohol in, in half our, our state. So we're moving very, very quickly to legalization on the state side and, and also on the federal side as well. There is the map. Um, Ohio and Minnesota were the latest two. A common misconception, though, is like, oh, medical, they don't need accountants. That's totally incorrect. So look at those green states. So my lifelong state is Oklahoma, which used to be a very red state, not a green state, anti-cannabis. They sued Colorado. They became a medical state in 2017, voted it in, even though they were very anti-cannabis, very conservative. Um, within a year of doing that, they had 12,000 new cannabis companies, 12,000. That's a very, very small population state. Um, and so very quickly, you know, I was getting calls from accountants and bookkeepers in Oklahoma. Andrew, I just landed five clients or 10 or 20 um, in like a month. And I have no idea what to do. I don't, I don't have tools or chart of accounts. How do I serve this? Same with Oregon. We were green for three years. We were medical. In 2017, we passed full rec and we went to rec. Didn't change a single thing on, on my work. We were still doing gap level accrual cost accounting for all verticals, farming, manufacturing, processing, labs, and retail in all 50 states. That won't change. Whether you're illegal, medical, rec, we do the same accounting. The tax return is exactly the same federally for all 50 states. Um, 280E applies. And so we do that as well. And so medical states can be great as well. I think we're going to see a lot more of these green states move to fully legal, um, hopefully including Florida. I think you're going to see states like Texas and Nebraska come in quicker than we think. But let's look at the overall market as well. Just at a general High-level um, economic outlook, 2024 is an election year. Generally speaking, that's very good for the stock market. Usually interest rates come down. Um, we're already seeing that. The Fed, and just yesterday, 
They've now said they're they they raised the late rates all last year, and that really hurt the economy, hurt mortgages and real estate. Now they paused twice in a row, and they've indicated that they're going to start lowering rates. I'm sure there is all kinds of pressure from Biden <laughs> um, and the current administration to they want to have it. You know, the, the incumbents always want stock market, interest rates, et cetera, economy need to be very good so they can get reelected and brag about the economy. And there's, this is actually pull off Twitter, but there you can find this information anywhere. This trend has been going for a long, long time. And especially in particular, you can see that spike up as interest rates moved up. When people can get 5% in the bank or in CDs or whatever, it makes a lot of sense. They're like, should I risk my money in the stock market or whatever? Or I can just go put it in the bank and get 5%. Now, that's not as great as it sounds if we have high inflation, which I think we all feel, all of us are feeling. Um, but this to me is good. There's there's trillions of dollars sitting in that's dry powder. So that money can go into the stock market, the bond market, the cannabis market, the crypto market. It is ready to go. And I think we're going to start seeing that money come back into these markets um, we talked about holding rate steady, and this was back in December, but that has come true. And um, where we are today, this slide on um, on global um, liquidity and M two is always important. And you can, you know, some people think this is the most important slide when you look at stocks, bonds, real estate for fifty years. Liquidity's gone up, money printing's gone up. Um, when that money is out there and it's free and it's easy and mortgage rates are super low so we can all borrow on credit cards and line of equity, it's generally good for asset markets. And so that's why um, we've had such a good bull run. Um, I think we'll, we'll see that continue and definitely in cannabis, which is the fastest growing niche. This again was printed at the end of 2023, but yes, we're seeing the markets at all time highs. They pulled back a little recently, but still very much up near all time highs. Now let's look at rescheduling and the cannabis. Now, first off, those uh, the general economic conditions are good. Um, cannabis, cannabis market itself has been up to the right for 10 years straight. And by that, I mean, if you just look simply at revenues, if you just said, what were the total legal cannabis sales in the nation in 2013, in 2014, every single year they've gone up and to the right. And we're, we've gone from zero to 33 billion last year. All um, predictions I see are anywhere from 80 to 90 billion in the next four to five years. So as massive as the growth has been the last 10 years, we expect to see double that growth in cannabis the next four or five years. Now, during that period, the equity hasn't mirrored that. The last two years, equity markets pulled back, they quit investing. And so we had some, some rough years in many markets, in crypto and cannabis and in stocks and high tech. We think that's going to come back this year, um, especially with the big growth. And then when we look at this rescheduling or possibly descheduling, that's that's the wild card. If and when this happens, you're going to see an absolute massive flood of capital coming into cannabis. And that's going to be very, very good for those of us that are CBAs, bookkeepers, accountants, CFOs, rural agents, whatever, serving this niche. The people that are in early and know what the heck they're doing are going to be um, really ready to um, um, kill it. So what are the drug schedules? These were put into place, um, kind of tied to our criminal code. The DEA may maintains these and controls them. There's ways to move things off Schedule 1. For example, in 2018, Congress got together, and in the Farm Bill, they added a thing that took hemp, and hemp and CBD were both on Schedule 1, the harshest, worst schedule to be on, and they not only didn't move it down to Schedule 4 or 5, they literally took hemp and CBD off the schedules altogether. Um, so that was done by Congress. The Supreme Court can do it. They've threatened to do it if Congress didn't get their act together because so many states have legalized. The easy way to do it is DEA. And so right this second, the HHS Department of the Government reviewed cannabis for over a year under Biden's recommendation. They now gave the recommendation to the DEA and said, hey, 
Cannabis does not belong in Schedule 1, <laughs> clearly. It belongs on Schedule 3. That's a recommendation. DEA has never not taken the HHS recommendation ever. Um, and they're reviewing it right now. We expect an answer any time now. It could be in the next couple of months um, to move it down to Schedule 3. Now, on top of that, the FDA chimed in. They said they also agree it should be put on Schedule 3. And then after that, 10 senators got together and wrote a letter to um, DEA saying, hey, this doesn't even belong in Schedule 3. This should be pulled off. We should regulate it like alcohol. If that happens, and, and by the way, it is election year, so I wouldn't put anything by. If, if, if they can pressure the DEA to deschedule this to get votes, it will be an absolute massive boon um, overnight, whether your state's illegal or not. I mean, imagine someplace like Texas. It'll be nuts. Um, Schedule 1, that big red X, to be on Schedule 1, it says there has to be no, no known medical use. And so things like LSD and cannabis and ecstasy and meth and heroin, all those things, and there's a potential for abuse and addiction. Well, the clearly the first and foremost, um, there are now over 100 medical uses, dot, not just anecdotally. We've had that for 50, if not hundreds of years, but now we have real science from hospitals, universities, our own federal government has, has scientific studies on everything from PTSD to anxiety, depression, autism, epilepsy, hundreds of ailments, um, you name it. Um, cannabis has documented use for it. So it clearly doesn't belong there. Um, even these schedule two drugs like, like um, meth, fentanyl that are killing thousands and thousands of people, um, Everyone knows it. This is wrong. Let's fix it. Um, so we think this is coming very quick. It is humongous news. Um, I'll show you a couple of these other articles. Um, can lead to cascade um, set of changing changes. We'll go through all those as well. Um, this, um, yeah, the same deal. The same. I'm not going to read all this. Same topic. HHS, the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, mentioned to let's move that down to Schedule 3. So where we think this is right now, we think it's on track. From my inside knowledge at, at our AICPA committees that we have every couple of weeks, and um, that has many prominent tax attorneys that are in discussions with DOJ and IRS, et cetera, they think it's coming any time now. So I'm super excited um, to see this come as well um, because it'd be big, big Big news. So what does it mean if so if cannabis is descheduled, I think that's a wild card. Could happen. If it does happen, I'm gonna be psyched. If it doesn't happen, we'll still be okay. Descheduling means cannabis kind of becomes like alcohol overnight. Can't sell it to, to minors, but it's controlled by the state liquor board or whatever. And we're gonna have liquor stores and people making the liquor and making the, the different products. If it's rescheduled to schedule three, that's very good news. From a cash flow perspective, 280E is only applies right here to Schedule 1 and 2. So if if you are Schedule 1 or 2 drug, you're required to file a tax return and you get zero deductions, zero credits. I'm not going to go into the ways we beat 280E or 471. That's a different webinar. But let's just say 280E goes away if we deschedule or we reschedule. Either way, 280E is gone, and we expect this pretty quick um, as well. This is from Green Market Report. This is looking at MSO, free cash flow, but this applies to any cannabis company. There's about 200,000 cannabis companies in the U.S. right now. That number will grow, I think, to four or 500,000 in the next two to three years, especially the eastern half of the U.S. And every existing cannabis company, overnight, their cash flow just went up anywhere from 15 to 30 percent. Um, you can see the green is free cash flow with 280E eliminated compared to with two. So if you look on the right or or wherever, it's double or triple where they were before. So just imagine that your company out there doing business and overnight your net income pops up, your EBITDA pops up, your free cash flow flops up. What else pops up? Your valuation pops up. That means access to capital pops up. So it's really, really good news for the cannabis industry. A lot of the stocks, public stocks are going to pop really quickly and just valuations for even privately held as well. Here's kind of a little table with and without 280E. And you can see it can be a 3X difference. Um, now, this is going to be different company to company. 
um, based on many factors and what state they're in and and how the structure set up. But it's going to be a, a big number. And even if you look over here, um, this is looking at the valuation. So they're using a simple holistic approach. Their discounted cash flow valuation. That's kind of how Warren Buffett values companies. It looks like a um, 8x increase to instead of selling your company at 1.76, you're selling it at 13. That's really good news for a lot of existing cannabis companies. And all these cannabis companies are struggling to raise capital right this second. I think the people that have those, remember the trillions of dollars sitting there, and it's not just private angel investors, it's also VCs, private equity, um, all these different groups of funds, family offices, they've got money and it's ready. And so if we get this good news in the industry, it's going to be big, big news and people are going to be jumping in. So let's look at the um, benefits and issues. Right off the bat, that lower rut Drug classification, we should see a lot more banking. There already is a lot of banking in the industry. That's a common myth that there's no banking, but we're going to see it open up even quicker. We might see access even to things that where, where, where retailers struggle with selling to their customers for all merchant services like PayPal, Stripe, Square, all those biggies, um, Visa, MasterCard. Maybe we open up to that. That would be humongous if that happened. Um, bankruptcy protection is huge. Right now, cannabis companies can't file for bankruptcy or, or restructure. So that's going to save jobs. And remember, all this is a great political um, win for everybody. Whether you're talking cities, counties, states, or feds, they all need money. And this brings tax dollars to everybody and jobs. And that's what they like to show in election year. We're bringing more jobs, more tax dollars to our local economies and our national economies. Interstate commerce hopefully will open up. There's a whole slew of issues around interstate commerce and what that means, but it will just open up. So, you know, I can remember in Oklahoma as an adult when we couldn't get craft brew in Oklahoma. You literally, I think I was 30 living there, we could get like Miller, Coors, and Bud. And I'd go to Colorado and I remember people, friends of mine, like we'd bring like say fat tire brew back from Colorado because we couldn't get um, good brew. But now that's pretty much ended. You can get good craft brew, I think in every state. I could be wrong on that. Um, but I think we'll see that with cannabis. So if if someone in Oregon's making a really nice um, craft CBD THC mixture, they can ship it everywhere in the U.S. Or maybe someone in Oklahoma is making a power bar that's got THC, they can ship it around. That's going to be huge for companies to grow their markets. There's going to be a change in R&D and research. You're going to see big pharma jump in in a big way. And that's going to be not millions, but billions of dollars just on that side. That's not really going on right now. But when big pharma jumps in, that's another billions and billions of dollars coming in. Um, we're still going to have compliance with state rules, also FDA, USDA um, as well. There may be new federal taxes on the industry. We'll see what happens with that. Um, hopefully they don't go over the top because this industry needs a break right now. Um, we saw this, like I said, in 2018 with the farm bill on CBD hemp. Um, if cannabis is deschedule, we already talked about this too, it'd be more like alcohol and hopefully we'll deschedule, but I'm all good for reschedule too. Um, if this happens now, this was the part I mentioned about the senators. They sent a letter to the DEA saying, Hey, this is stupid. Let's fully legalize it. There's no reason to have this on there. And, and really, even if you made it equal to alcohol, there's pretty good evidence now that people using weed are not driving around drunk at 3 a.m. getting in wrecks and killing people. People drunk are still doing that and killing people in the tens of thousands. Um, so alcohol, is, I would say, is more dangerous to our society and even to violence. There's more people that get drunk and get violent as opposed to on weed um, as well. So anyway, the... Um, and again, this is kind of out of that letter. Rescheduling would do little to, to rectify these severe harms um, and many criminal penalties will continue. And so, again, we're trying to get people out of jail at this point. Anyone in jail for marijuana at this point should be out. Um, there's no reason for a single human to be in jail over marijuana, um, in my opinion. <laughs> um, 
Now, this does this first sentence was important, so I wanted to put this in here. The DEA has never kept a drug in Schedule One after HHS recommended removing it, and it must not do so now. It's imperative that it do do so quickly. And so the DEA has been sitting on this now for about six, seven months, and hopefully their review is almost complete. But again, this could be any day now. And when this happens, again, um, if you're someone sitting on the fence, don't be, I'll just pause here for a minute. I talked to thousands of accountants the last eight years, and I've talked to many, many people trying to pick their niche or they picked a niche and they didn't like it. And they're like, oh, I did dentist for a while and they were overserved. And I wished I got in early to dentist niche or I, I never get in early. This is your chance to get in early. In your 30 year career like mine, you might get a chance to get in on the birth of an industry this size, this quickly, getting in early once or twice, maybe in your whole career. The time is right now. I am passionate about this, um, whether you join my program or not. If you are a CBA bookkeeper accountant and you want to run your own business, you've never had a better time. Most of you also tell me you hate marketing and finding clients. Well, then this again is the answer. You can find these clients everywhere. And if this reschedules, you're going to see that explode. So marketing becomes even easier. Let's look at the industry and the verticals real quick. Um, one other thing about the growth real quick, not just is the federal possibly going to grow that we just talked about rescheduling, even if they don't, we're still going to see state growth as we have every single election year. We're going to see it this year too. More states are going to legalize. But not only that, our clients are growing rapidly. Nobody opens up one dispensary or one farm. Oftentimes you'll see a startup with $20 million that they're going to launch three dispensaries and a farm and a manufacturer. Or they're going to launch five dispensaries or two farms. Or even if they do launch one dispensary, like my client um, Jeremy here, you know, that one dispensary over the last 10 years became four two farms, a coffee shop, and now he's going into multi-state. So everyone's growing rapidly, and that's good for us as well. Our client fees grow right along with that as well. We're going to need to be with them. They need deep dive CFO level services. We can help them with licensing, with compliance, with audits, with M&A, capital raises, exits, software, legal, structuring, funding structures, on and on and on. That's before we even talk about accounting, payroll, HR, tax returns. We can do a lot and we can get paid a lot if we'll do a lot. The verticals, um, usually I do this earlier, but there's lots of verticals. This is not a niche, it's an industry and it's massive. So we've got farming at the top, whether we're talking hemp, CBD or cannabis, we grow the plants. They got lots of chemicals. We take those chemicals out in processing plants. And there's there's THC and CBD in both cannabis and hemp. But guess what? There's 10 other chemicals and or actually 100 others, CBN and CBG and all these other chemicals that are going to be used for recreation or medicine, Delta-8, all these variants. We're just at the tip of the iceberg. From there, we can take these oils and flowers and make them into products, into foods, into beverages, into snacks, into lotions, tinctures, nasal sprays, a thousand different products. Those will come just like we see in alcohol and beverage and food. The products never stop. You know, we've been eating food a long time, but there's new products and snacks created every year. You're going to see that here too. We see distribution and wholesale companies, testing labs that test the weed. These, these can be great clients. You know, a testing lab costs five to $10 million to get off the ground. Retail and dispensaries, those are great clients as well. Delivery companies and then thousands of an ancillary companies, whether they're lighting companies, software companies, payroll companies, lots and lots of companies in this niche. Um, what we've already been discussing, a lot of this is why it's hard to be a good cannabis CFO. This is not many firms out there and many bookkeepers out there try to serve this kind of on the side. Oh, yeah, I picked up a dispensary or a farm. It's not a good idea. You can do that. You're just not going to do a great job of it. And so me and other Dope CFO VIP members come in and eat your lunch. If, you're, if that's you, like, look, we're not generalists. We went all in on in this industry. We know about the software, the banking, the insurance, the accounting, the cost accounting, all of it. We're experts. Um, we've got to be able to go in deep. We've got to be able to have a way to get the accounting tools and work papers. You know, you can maybe the smartest CPA in the world. Um, I was a pretty smart CPA, but I still had to spend hundreds, if not thousands of hours building over 100 work papers at this point. We have 13 cost accounting templates in our program. Um, 
cleanups a given. The state mandated seal to set tracking software is very complex. We have to understand all these different pieces of software, seed to sale, POS systems, accounting systems, ERPs, um, and there's just a gazillion of them. Every client will have a different tech stack. We've got to help help even guide them on which tech stack to use. We've got consolidations. Um, sometimes you'll have one, one dispensary and one farm, but they'll have eight entities and a couple of consolidations. We need lots of uh, strong controls with the cash and inventory involved, governance. Um, you're generally going to have investors and lenders because it's you can't start a farm, indoor, outdoor, a manufacturing plant, a processing plant, a dispensary chain without tens of millions of dollars. I recommend if you have under 10 million, you're probably going to struggle for any of that. Um, what does that mean? The startups are going to have investors just like high tech. Investors want great reporting. They want perpetual data rooms. They want to have CFOs that understand financial models and pitch decks. Um, we want to be able to do all that as well. Just what I was talking about. Investors, they want perpetual data rooms. Um, they want, they've been burned before. 10 years ago when this first hit, it was a gold rush and investors were throwing money even at crappy companies with no controls. That has changed. They want to see world-class CFO people coming in. They want to see people that know what they're doing. They're concerned about taxes, fines, penalties, risk of loss of license. They want things done right. We've seen many cannabis companies lose their license. Could you imagine if you wrote a $5 million check to a farm or whoever, and then the farm screwed around and lost their license, and you're like, what the hell? Oh, sorry, you lost your $5 million. That, that doesn't make sense. We need to be there um, to help these um, companies. So anyway, that is going to wrap up kind of where we are. Mm -hmm.